And there's a lot more to this world that we actually don't even see or perceive or understand. And many people have actually, uh, when, when they use DMT, uh, they actually say that this helps them understand the greater understanding of everything. We were talking about DMT last night and we talked how we had very similar experiences right. uh, when, when, when we were on it. Can you tell us about your experiences and what you took out of DMT? Well, I, I took it in the form of ayahuasca. I only took it twice in, in, in about three days in Brazil in 2003. I've not uh, touched it since, and uh, I don't feel the need to, but the, the experience I had was, yeah. was, was, was massive. And for me, what the, you know, people say, you know, um, it took me somewhere. Um, I don't think it takes us anywhere. I think it takes us to where we already are. And if we're in a, 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 neg a really deeply negative state, you can take this stuff and have a real, what they used to call in the 60s, a bad trip. Or if you're in a, another state, you can have a, a wonderful experience. Yeah. My experience was, was just unforgettable. I mean, I had a, a, a voice, a woman's voice, uh, which is, what is a woman's voice? Oh, it's just it's a woman talking to him. No, it's, it's a frequency. It is an information field of a certain frequency, and certain frequencies you decode as female, and certain frequencies you decode as male. It's, it's a consciousness that is communicating, and almost certainly, well, it has to be if we're all infinite awareness, it's an expression of your own consciousness, just a very much deeper level of it. And, um, and for five hours it talked to me about the illusory nature of reality. And I had instant recall of every word afterwards, um, which was amazing in itself. Um, and I was taken to a place, um, oh, I'm using human language here, taken to a place. It's very hard to describe. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, I tell you, it's a, it's a place that I experienced um, as beyond the realm of vibration. Because every, anything that vibrates, oh, this is actually funny enough, uh, Luke, this is one of the, the, the many st really stunning lines that this, this voice communicated to me. Because when it started off, it said, we're going to take you to where, where you come from, so you, you will understand better where you are, and where you're coming back to. And then it kept repeating, this is right at the start of, of this, this, this voice starting, five hours. Infinite love is the only truth, everything else is illusion. And when you, you study near-death experiences and all that stuff, when they, they go into these realms beyond the body, I have never come across anyone that wanted to come back because they talk about this unbelievable uh, bliss and love and all the rest of it. And anyway, um, I uh, had this, this stunning line I was talking about at one point. It said, infinite love is the only truth. Everything else is illusion. If it vibrates, it's illusion. Right. Because the pure, infinite all that is, all possibility, is still and silent. People think that things have to move to, to be something, and actually um, silence is all sound. It's all possibility waiting to manifest. So if I'm talking now, I have picked out of that infinite possibility of sound, I have picked out the words that I am talking. And when I stop, apart from the traffic, it's gone back into silence. Within the silence is everything. So I experience this as this silent stillness, as the infinite uh, point of attention. And I took the form of a... Uh, it, this sounds really funny, but if you've experienced it, people know what I mean. I saw it as a shining blackness. Shining blackness. Now, years later, um, in fact, in the last 12 months, there was a doctor called Eben Alexander. And he was, uh, in, I think he's in New York, and he was a um, neurosurgeon. I think he still is. And he was one of these rigid kind of, People. He admits it in his book. I was one of these rigid people. That, uh, he, you know, obviously, people would have near-death experiences when he was doing his surgery sometimes, and he, they'd tell him his, their stories. And, and, and as he said, I thought, oh, that's that's very interesting, a lot of rubbish, but it's very interesting. And and it was like mainstream. This is not possible. This world is all there is. And then he got uh, um, it was a form of a, a meningitis that was so bad 
that his brain shut down in every area apart from the most primitive level that was necessary to keep him alive. This man, in effect, died for seven days. And this is the interesting point which he points out. When people talk about, and there's millions and millions of them now, when they talk about near-death experiences, the mainstream scientists, they go, oh, this is not impossible. I don't, I don't, oh, please, God, save us from science. And, and anyway, uh, be, and because what they're doing is they're, they're just reliving their experiences from this part of the brain, and that's what's happening, and all that stuff. Well, that part of the brain, in his case, completely shut down. It was inactive, so it ain't coming from there. And, and he came back. He should, he should not have lived. That was a virtual impossibility for him to live. It was certainly almost absolutely impossible for him, if he did live, to be anything more than a vegetative state. And he came back uh, after a transition period completely normal and went on with his life. And he wrote this book about it, which became a New York bestseller. Why I'm telling you this story, it's very interesting, I think, is because... When he first left the body and had a near-death experience himself, he entered a realm. I talk about this in, in, the, in the new book that's coming out in, uh, in the autumn. Um, he went into a realm that was classically the, the realm of the demons and the, uh, what I would call the, 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 the archons and the, the, the reptilian entities and all this stuff. In fact, he talks about seeing reptilian beings brushing against him and all that stuff. And then uh, a light came down. Um, and, and he was taken out, th what he called, through the gate into this amazing, blissful place. And on and on and on, until, this is where I'm coming round to, he said he was taken to experience the, the, the ultimate, the, the, the source. And you know what he, he, just, he calls it? The dazzling darkness. Wow. Exactly yeah. what I experienced. Yeah. Um, and the dazzling darkness is mesmerizing because it is all that is, has been, and ever can be. And then we pull that all, potential, all possibility, all potential, into worlds of certain expressions of that potential, and this is one of them. Um, and so um, that experience uh, with the ayahuasca, DMT, was, was massively important for me, because what I did then, you know, I, I, what I do when I research, I don't just take one thing and then say, well, that's all right then. Uh, I came back to England and I looked at the mainstream science in all the different areas to see if I could f confirm that what was being said was true. Everything, everything checked out, the whole bloody thing. And once you've got this point where you realize it's an illusion, you can still interact with the illusion and live in the illusion but you know it's an illusion and illusions only control you when you think they're real this is why it's important to understand the nature of what, what we're, yeah. it, we're in because if we think this is solid and all the rest of it what does solid say immediately limitation can't be done and yet it's just a holographic proje uh, projection of, of infinite possibility which is totally malleable and can be changed any time it's fascinating, it's amazing because uh, just so people know, DMT is a natural reoccurring chemical in your brain. It comes out a little bit when you dream, but when you pass away, it's just flooded in your brain. And you could actually take it in the physical form and, and, and actually see what happens. I had the very similar experience, just blinding darkness, and then uh, a lady telling me the same thing, that love is the ultimate answer, love is the ultimate solution. It's, it sounds crazy, it sounds insane, but there's, there's a lot more to everything than, than we actually know. Yeah, though this is, a, this is an interesting point, because... When you look at people um, in so-called history, way back, take Leonardo da Vinci and another guy who followed him in Italy very soon afterwards, a couple of decades or so, called uh, Giordano Bruno. Da Vinci is remembered by most people as the painter of the Mona Lisa. The man was an absolute technological genius. I mean, I've seen documentaries about him, and he was 500 years ago where they found his notebooks, interestingly one of the biggest collections of um, da Vinci's uh, drawings and stuff is at Windsor Castle and one of his notebooks is owned by Bill Gates. I mean these, these, these people know, you know, about a lot of this stuff, so they just keep it from us. Um, and this documentary took drawings and technical um, text which he wrote 
um, in these uh, notebooks and they tried to make it and it worked. Um, Sikorsky, in, with the, the uh, development of the helicopters, said that he studied da Vinci's work on, on that form of flight because da Vinci was obsessed with flying. And um, the first kind of armored tank type vehicle he uh, drew and um, designed 500 years ago. An interesting thing too, in those days there was no copyright, so there was a fundamental flaw in every single thing that was in that notebook, everything he designed. What he'd done is take one part of it and turn it over the opposite way. So if anyone found the notebook, they wouldn't be able to build it, it wouldn't work, but for, he knew that. Why I'm telling you this story and why I'm going on to talk about uh, briefly uh, Giordano Bruno, who was burned at the stake by the Roman Inquisition in 1600 for the crime of saying there are multiple worlds and supporting things like the earth goes round the sun and you know all the rest of it. Um, these people, when you read their stuff, um, were so far advanced of their era and what people say about them, even today, like da Vinci, is he was hundreds of years ahead of his time. He wasn't. He wasn't. He was beyond time, right? This is the key to understanding this stuff. We are within this frequency range I'm talking about, with, um, in the, within the five senses, and most people are held in that frequency range. That frequency range is a range of energy, which means a range of information. If you can expand your mind and go beyond that into those upper realms, you're going into another level of information, inspiration, insight and understanding. Now, we think of a linear um, Stone Age through Middle Age, through uh, Victorian Age into Modern Age, and we see that progression. This level of awareness, this is, but that's just a, a sequence of events within this tiny frequency range. That level of awareness is always there. It has always been there. In the Stone Age, if anyone could have expanded their mind, they could have got into that level of insight. And all the people like da Vinci are doing and um, uh, Bruno were doing is in their era when most people were so suppressed, not least in those days because religion was absolutely squeezing people's sense of perception, they were going into these realms where this knowledge existed. And when they bring it from, from the unseen into the seen, they're caught ahead of their time and all they do is accessing the library. So when you talk about, you know, a female voice saying everything is love and I talk about a female voice saying everything is love and, and I see this sparkling darkness and you see this sparkling darkness and Ibn Alexander, the doctor, sees the dazzling darkness. All you're doing is expanding your mind and going into that level of, of reality where you can experience these things and get the insight from them. It is so simple. But the worst nightmare of the conspiracy is having people go in there because they see the bloody conspiracy. So you've got to keep them here, and that's what it's all about. That's what microchipping's about. That's what um, uh, transhumanism is all about. It's about fusing uh, microchips and fusing technology with the body to stop it being its true uh, uh, its true design, which is to uh, uh, be a vehicle for the body to um, experience this reality, but also allowing consciousness to expand beyond. They want to stop the second bit. That's what the microchip's about, really. I mean, many other things, but certainly that.